on, Dr. Ken Landau. Thanks for joining us. This is Well Now Doctor. We're going to be discussing irritable bowel syndrome. Irritable bowel syndrome, or simply IBS, is a phenomenally common disorder. It's a disorder of the intestine plus other parts of the body. It's a disorder that we've known about for quite some time, but unfortunately, we don't have any good diagnostic tests. A lot of people who suffer from the condition don't even know they have it. Lots of other people flocking to doctor's offices. And the question is, how do we make the diagnosis? What are the appropriate kind of tests, if any? And how do we treat it? Well, irritable bowel syndrome fits into what we call the functional gastrointestinal disorders. Now, in the group are conditions like functional dyspepsia. When you have indigestion, and there isn't any reason you don't seem to have any reflux of acid, or some people have functional constipation or functional diarrhea. They have diarrhea or they have constipation, and there isn't any reason for it. We've studied them, we've evaluated them. No infection, no other abnormality. Of all of the types of functional disorder in the gut, there is none more common than irritable bowel syndrome. How do we define it? Well, it seems to be a chronic disorder. It's associated with abdominal pain or discomfort. And in addition to that, it has a major component of change in the either frequency or form of the bowel movement. In other words, you're either constipated or you have diarrhea. You can alternate between the two. And you have an abnormality in the appearance of the stool. It's either hard and lumpy or watery and mushy. Onset of the pain is frequently associated with the need to go to the bathroom. The need to go to the bathroom seems to be associated oftentimes with a reduction in the amount of pain. And in addition to all of this, people often have abdominal bloating. Now, there are certain factors that seem to be associated with worsening of the condition. So people take certain kinds of drugs or when they're under stress, either at home or at work, interpersonal kinds of stress make it worse, and so too can a change in diet. Well, what do we know about the condition? So we said it's abdominal pain associated with a disturbance of the defecation, oftentimes associated with gastrointestinal or a lower bowel cramping, seems to be relieved by defecation, going to the bathroom. And we know that the pain seems to be associated with both gastrointestinal and areas outside of the intestine as well. So if we look overall, the diagnosis is relatively straightforward, but with a lot of people who have the condition, unfortunately, either not seeing doctors or not getting the appropriate diagnosis. Frequently, the diagnosis is delayed. It seems to be the most common cause of referrals to gastroenterologists, maybe as many as 20 to 50 percent of all people going to gastrointestinal specialists for medical problems because of the irritable bowel syndrome. And certainly it's the most common diagnosis that gastroenterologists seem to make. We know that the likelihood of your suffering from this condition is probably somewhere around one in five during the course of your lifetime, but the symptoms don't have to persist forever. In fact, we know that somewhere on the order of five to 15% of populations throughout the world basically suffer at some point in time from the irritable bowel syndrome. We know that millions of people seek relief and even more millions don't seek relief, probably only about 10, 15, 20% of the people who have the symptoms ultimately see a doctor for these kind of problems. Now, it's important that you realize that the irritable bowel syndrome causes a significant amount of distress. It changes the quality of life. It causes a lot of people to seek medical care and have a lot of unnecessary tests. It has significant socioeconomic impact on people because it seems to be in relatively young folks at the time when they're beginning their career, going to school, raising families, can become chronically disabling. We know that it's present throughout the world, doesn't seem to be localized to any one individual racial or ethnic or socioeconomic group. We know the diagnosis is basically established on the symptoms that a person has. 
we don't have any confirmatory testing. It's not like if we were trying to make the diagnosis of pneumonia, where we could go and take a chest x-ray. It's not like having the diagnosis of hepatitis, where we can do a blood test. There are no tests that are confirmatory for the irritable bowel syndrome. There's no structural abnormality. There's no disease marker. There's no abnormality in the bloodstream that we can easily monitor. Now, we know that people who have this kind of condition can have significant pain. And the pain can be either mild, but more importantly, oftentimes it can be quite disabling. It can be moderate or it can be severe. And we know it gets worse with emotional stress. We know that after eating, it seems to get worse. We know that there are several different types of irritable bowel syndrome. There's the irritable bowel syndrome where the person has the abdominal pain and discomfort and it can be associated with either diarrhea or constipation or an alteration, alternation between those two types. So we know that we define the irritable bowel syndrome associated with diarrhea when at least 25% of the stools over a period of time are loose, watery, or mushy. Less than 25% are hard or lumpy. For irritable bowel syndrome associated with constipation, just exactly the reverse, more than 25% being hard or lumpy and less than 25% being mushy or watery. We know that if you look at all of the people who have the irritable bowel syndrome, about four out of every 10 have diarrhea associated as the predominant bowel disorder. In about 35%, about a third of the people, it seems to be constipation. And in another quarter of the people, it seems to alternate between the two. Now, Irritable bowel syndrome associated with constipation seems to be much more frequent in women, about two and a half times more frequent in women than men. On the other hand, irritable bowel syndrome associated with diarrhea tends to be more common in men than women. Overall, women seem to be affected more than men. It has an insidious onset in most people, although it may be acute, for the overwhelming majority of the people suffering from irritable bowel syndrome, symptoms just seem to come on slowly. Here in the United States, it's estimated that at any given time, maybe we can have as many as one in eight people who are going to be affected. That's lifetime incidents, one in eight people. Women, more common than men, maybe women about one in seven, men about one in 11. If we look at other areas of the world, if we go and evaluate the people in Southeast Asia, maybe about 7%. If we go down to Brazil, well, maybe as many as 20 or 25% of the people affected with this condition. If we look overall, it seems that the incidence in women here in the United States is probably one and a half to threefold greater than it is in men. On the other hand, if we go to other areas of the world, for instance, if we go to Egypt, seems like the incidence is equal between men and women. If we look at symptom relief, men and women seem to be equally susceptible to benefit. If we look at the age group, well, it seems to be less prevalent in people over the age of 50 compared to under the age of 50. And as a matter of fact, half of the people with the syndrome begin their first symptoms prior to the time they're 35 years of age. Symptoms can be stable over the course of a lifetime, or more likely, they're going to change. They're going to vary somewhat. And as a matter of fact, with age, the symptoms may eventually seem to go away. And if we look at the people who are over age 50, they seem to have fewer symptoms than younger people. People who are of lower socioeconomic means seem to have more kind of symptoms. Now, if we look at the incidence of irritable bowel syndrome with diarrhea, well, we find that a significant number of those people are going to have some mucus discharge, but the diarrhea is not going to be associated with either large volume of diarrhea. There's no blood in the bowel movement. The need to go to the bathroom doesn't awaken a person at night, and a person does not have greasy stools. All of those would be indications for other kind of medical disorders. Now, sometimes the irritable bowel syndrome associated with diarrhea 
can come on after some sort of intestinal infection. We call this post-infectious irritable bowel syndrome. And it might be a little bit different. It oftentimes comes on when a person's had an infection, a bacterial infection more so than anything else. It tends to be associated with fever, maybe vomiting or diarrhea, and oftentimes a culture of the stool that shows some sort of a pathogen. What do we know about the history of irritable bowel syndrome? Well, the first description was right before the Civil War. It was described in 1849. It was described in people who seemed to have bowel habits that would alternate between diarrhea and constipation and back to diarrhea. During the 1800s, and up until actually very recently, the diagnosis was established by exclusion. The person had the symptoms, and then the person had significant medical evaluation, had a medical evaluation because people were worried that maybe there was a tumor, maybe there was some other kind of significant abnormality that needed to be perhaps treated with fancy medicine or maybe even surgery. Well, unfortunately, that led to a significant amount of operations and operative intervention led to a lot of unnecessary treatment. So in 1978, Manning established the first criteria so that the diagnosis could be established not with a lot of testing, but just by examining the individual. And as a matter of fact, extensive testing was thought to be inappropriate. Now, these people had abdominal distension, at least Dr. Manning thought maybe they had some relief with defecation. They had frequent stools with the onset of the pain, or maybe loose stools with the onset of the pain, or maybe they had some, some mucus, or maybe they even had the sense of incomplete evacuation when they went to the bathroom. Well, that was the original thought. So over a period of time, the concepts of irritable bowel syndrome have morphed. Not that we really know any more about it, but they developed some international criteria. They called the Rome 1, the Rome 2, and the Rome 3 criteria established in 1989 and 1999 and 2005 most recently. And they said that in order to have the diagnosis established that you would have to have recurrent abdominal pain and discomfort at least three days a month for at least three months. Didn't have to be consecutive days. You had to have the onset of the pain with some change in the stool frequency or change in the stool appearance. And people have thought at different times that you had to have a, a problem with evacuating the bowels, the need for manual extraction, all of those sorts of things. But at least in the present time, it's thought not to be necessary to make the diagnosis. Now, we should differentiate irritable bowel syndrome from that functional constipation we talked about, or even the functional diarrhea. So let's just take the functional constipation for a moment. Well, in order to have this diagnosis established, you have to have, for at least the last three months, you have to have symptoms of constipation. And the symptoms, even though you've had them for three months, had to begin at least six months ago. And at least 25% of the time, you must have had hard time or straining when you went to the bathroom, or you must have had hard or lumpy stools, the sensation that there was some kind of a blockage, the need to manually extricate some of the bowel movement. You had to have fewer than three bowel movements a week. The idea about having loose stools, well, that was very rare. And you didn't have enough pain to make the diagnosis of irritable bowel syndrome. The thing that differentiates irritable bowel with constipation from just functional constipation is the presence of the pain. So, how do we go about evaluating people? Well, we have to realize that all sorts of gastrointestinal symptoms may occur and we have to decide whether they're part of the syndrome or not. So for instance, we have bloating, bloating, the feeling of abdominal distension. Some people say it's appropriate to add it in. Maybe that's part of the irritable bowel syndrome. And as we'll talk about a little bit later when we talk about treatment, it probably is important because dietary means are going to be able to relieve some of the bloating. But we also have some nausea. We have some non-chest pain, so non-cardiac pain, I mean to say. And it's important to realize that people who have the irritable bowel syndrome have an enormous range of symptoms, even symptoms not involving the gut, 
And these people then go to the doctors that they think are appropriate, depending on what the principal manifestation happens to be. So they go to different subspecialists and they go to people because they think they have symptoms. For instance, they might have anxiety or depression as their principal symptom. And these people might then go to see a psychiatrist or see the family doctor. And sometimes people have what we call the somatoform disorder. They imagine they have a physical ailment because they really have a psychological ailment. So these are the people who are going to go see the psychiatrist. And on the other hand, we have a lot of people who really have the irritable bowel syndrome or something in this family, and their principal manifestations might be either fibromyalgia or chronic fatigue syndrome, or maybe they have temporomandibular joint dysfunction, or maybe they have chronic pelvic pain, or maybe some of these people have backache, or they're, they're just tired. And fatigue is a major portion, major component of the irritable bowel syndrome. And sometimes people have asthma, and some people have headache, and some people have what they imagine is gastroesophageal reflux, but that's part of the functional gastrointestinal disorders that we mentioned a few moments ago. That's the dyspepsia, functional dyspepsia. And some people have difficulty urinating. And they might see a urologist because they might think if they're a man, they might think that they have some sort of a disorder of the genitourinary system. Maybe they think as they get a little bit older that they have prostatitis, difficulty starting or stopping the stream, maybe a little bit of dribbling. And all of these symptoms are oftentimes comorbid events. In other words, they just happen to be present in the people who have the functional gastrointestinal disorders, the irritable bowel syndrome, and then we have to say, is the functional bowel syndrome, is it really a disease by itself, or is it something else? And as a matter of fact, at the present time, we don't really know where it fits in. Well, at least to make the diagnosis of the intestinal part, History and physical almost always is all a person needs. We generally don't need to do any tests. However, if there are some alarm symptoms, if there are some peculiarities, then yes, indeed, let's go and do some tests. But let's otherwise limit them. Now, what we have to say is that some organic diseases can be present. But as long as the person doesn't have any of the alarm symptoms, as long as the person doesn't have maybe anemia or significant weight loss or a history of inflammatory disease or malignant disease, a person doesn't have a history of colorectal cancer. If the onset is less than age 50, if the person does not have an abdominal mass, doesn't have any rectal bleeding, doesn't have any nocturnal abdominal pain or nocturnal diarrhea or progressive abdominal pain, if the person doesn't have a family history of either colorectal cancer, inflammatory bowel disease, regional enteritis, Crohn's disease, person doesn't have celiac disease in the family, then it's possible not to do any tests. Now, it also is possible if the person's traveled and maybe the person's gone out of the country, maybe the person's gone camping, well, it's possible that you can pick up an infectious disease. So you might develop some Girardia or maybe you develop a, a cryptosporidiosis. Maybe you've been out camping, maybe you've been up in Colorado or something like that, or over in Russia. Now you come back and you have a gastrointestinal disorder. Maybe you've been down in Mexico and have a gastrointestinal disorder. That puts you at risk, as we'll decide later, for the post-infectious irritable bowel syndrome. Well, what kind of tests should we do? In the overwhelming majority of people, when the history is chronic, when there isn't anything special, we don't have to do any tests. However, because we know that in irritable bowel syndrome, about 5% of the people have celiac disease, gluten sensitivity, well, versus 1% in the general population, it might be good to do a simple blood test to make sure the person doesn't have the celiac disease. On the other hand, in some people, it might be appropriate to do a simple blood test, a blood count to make sure the person's not anemic, check to make sure there isn't any liver impairment, Sugar is okay. Maybe we do a simple test for inflammation. Simple blood tests in some people, not all of the people. Well, in the future, we're going to have probably better methods to make the diagnosis. We're going to be able to examine the stool. We're going to find some fecal markers, just like we're finding for colorectal cancer nowadays. Maybe we're going to have a blood test 
down the road. And as a matter of fact, one of the companies has developed a blood test where they look at 10 different markers. That's not appropriate for right now. We know, as we've mentioned, that a significant number of people have these other conditions as well, fibromyalgia, the chronic fatigue syndrome, the chronic pelvic pain. So those things have to be factored into our evaluation to decide whether the person has a significant disease or, or perhaps has nothing more than irritable bowel syndrome. And that's enough, of course. Well, if we look at people's ideas, and if we listen to patients, probably about 50% of them believe that they have a food allergy and the food allergy is causing their problem. But that doesn't seem to be the case because we know in the population in general, about one, two, or maybe even 3% of the population suffer from food allergies, but somewhere between 30 and 50% of people who have irritable bowel syndrome think they have food allergies. But when they're tested, when they're very carefully tested, then it seems that the food allergies, not sensitivities, but food allergies are not indeed the case. Now, why do people get the irritable bowel syndrome? The answer is we just don't know. And as we've said, you might have the irritable bowel syndrome by itself, or you might have it associated with a variety of other disorders. What we think now, or what some people think, is that it's a complex interaction. And it's an interaction of the gut itself, the body's immune system, the nervous system. So when we talk about the gut, we mean either what's inside the gut, the bacteria, maybe the food, maybe the lining of the colon, maybe the epithelial barrier, maybe it's the intestine, the small intestine, the large intestine, maybe the propulsive mechanisms aren't correct, or maybe the body just has some hypersensitivity of the gut and the, the areas around the gut. And, and then, of course, we have to decide whether there is some psychiatric component involved in this. And most people say there probably is not. It was thought once upon a time when people were evaluated in doctor's offices for the irritable bowel syndrome that, yeah, a lot of them seem to have anxiety or depression or some other kind of psychological, psychiatric disorder. But remember, we said that relatively few, anywhere between 12% and 30% of the people who have the disease go to doctors. And when we look at people who don't go to doctors principally, we just evaluate the general population who are suffering from the symptoms, then we find that it's a relatively normal, well-adjusted population. Other things that might be involved in causing the disorder, maybe there's something wrong with the mucus that lines the small intestine or the large intestine, or maybe it's the interaction of the immune system that protects the gut, or maybe there's some kind of a genetic alteration. Well, we know stress and anxiety certainly can be important. We know that, at least in animals, and humans too, of course, when there's stress, that causes an increased outpouring of a variety of hormones, including cortisone, that can change the intestinal function. We know that stress can magnify the severity of diarrhea and a variety of other gastrointestinal situations. Certainly, stress changes the motility of the gut. It can even change the gastrointestinal gene expression. We know that because of stress, a variety of hormones, serotonin, cholecystokinin, can be released, and these are going to alter bowel function and may at least contribute, somehow contribute, to the presentation of the irritable bowel syndrome. We know there's a crucial involvement, but what the involvement is between the brain and the gut and the gut and the brain, both ways, both directions, we just don't honestly know. But we know that there are a lot of chemicals from the brain that work on the gut and from the gut that work on the brain. And they work on the brain through the autonomic nervous system and the neuroimmune system and the neuroendocrine system. So we have a lot of crosstalk. And on top of this, we know that the bacteria and we know that the diet interacts as well. So what can we say about stress? We know it's involved somehow, but we don't exactly know how. Now, talking about things that can be and should be involved, let's talk a little bit about the bacteria in the gut. Bacteria in the gut, very important. 
We know that there are at least a thousand different species of bacteria, most of which we have not yet been able to identify. However, if you look at the bacteria in the gut, the number of cells of bacteria in the gut, they're 10 times greater than the number of cells in your entire body. And if we look at the number of genes involved in those bacteria in the gut, they're probably about 150 fold more numerous than the genes in your body. Now the bacteria in your gut are very important for the development and the function and the formation of the gut. Well, the bacteria to a large extent are going to significantly alter the immune system, the way the immune system develops, the sensations that occur in the gut, the inflammation in the gut, lots of different things. And as a matter of fact, when we talk about bacteria in the gut, we think of that as just one solitary area where all the bacteria are alike. Well, that's not indeed the case. We know that there's a significant difference in the size of the number of organisms and the diversity of the organisms from different areas in the gut, all the way from your mouth down through your stomach and your small intestine, the upper part, the lower part of your small intestine, completely separate. And then, of course, in the colon. So there is a significant diversity, and to some extent, that may well be genetically determined. It seems that after weaning, it might be relatively the same throughout the course of a lifetime, relatively similar, except maybe if you have an infection, maybe if you take an antibiotic. We know that, that the bacteria in your gut are significantly altered by even the mode of delivery, cesarean section versus vaginal delivery. We know that the bacteria in your gut are significantly affected by breastfeeding versus formula feeding. Breastfeeding more fiber, more carbohydrate, formula feeding more fats. Well, it's very important to realize that a significant number of people are going to develop the irritable bowel syndrome for the first time after they have some sort of infectious condition. And as a matter of fact, somewhere between maybe about 5% and 30 or 35% of people who are infected with invasive pathogens, in other words, bugs that, that cause problems, they may have significant later development of post-infectious irritable bowel syndrome. So you have a bacterial infection in your gut, bacterial gastroenteritis, and that could lead to something more. Now, we're not talking about the, the minor viral infections that most of us get, the viral gastroenteritis. Viruses don't seem to cause much problem. On the other hand, the bacteria, and especially the protozoa, they cause problems. And it's not just the minor infections. We're talking about invasive infections. So who's at risk for this particular kind of irritable bowel syndrome? Well, again, young people, but we know young people are more apt to get the irritable bowel syndrome than older people. If you have more of a prolonged fever, you're more likely to have the problem. And people with anxiety or depression or people who are hypochondriacal, they seem to have more likelihood of developing this post infectious irritable bowel syndrome. Cigarette smokers, people who've had more stress in their life, people who have more severe or more toxic bacterial infections and people who are bad enough to be treated with an antibiotic. Now, during the episode, we know that there's going to be significant intestinal inflammation. There's going to be altered permeability of the intestine. So it's not going to be a good barrier between what's on the inside of your gut and what's on the inside of your body. Maybe you're going to malabsorb some of the bile acids, you know, that are manufactured in the liver and stored in the gallbladder. Maybe you're going to have an abnormal amount of neuroendocrine substances floating around. Maybe that serotonin that we talked about is going to have a significant factor. Well, we know that this post-infectious irritable bowel syndrome may give us a clue as to what's causing the standard irritable bowel syndrome. We might have an overgrowth of bacteria. There's a concept that was most recently discussed 
from doctors at UCLA, and they suggested that maybe people who have irritable bowel syndrome really had an overgrowth of bacteria where you're normally supposed to have some bacteria, but not an overgrowth, maybe in the small bowel. So what the doctors decided was that we had a small intestinal bacterial overgrowth that was leading to some of the symptoms. And what was happening is that there was an alteration of the kind of gas that was being performed normally in the bowel, methane gas is produced, but here hydrogen gas was being produced. And, and it was found that they could do a special kind of a breath test, and this breath test after giving people some lactulose showed that there was some hydrogen that was produced in higher concentrations than normal, and then they decided, well, ha ha, then what we should do is we should go and treat these people with some antibiotics, kill the bacteria, where the bacteria are causing the symptoms, and then everybody will live happily ever after. And what they found was that about 75% of the people who had the irritable bowel syndrome had an abnormality on this breath test, but it really doesn't sound like or look like or act like an infection. And as a matter of fact, if you eradicate the bacteria, you might get better for a short period of time, but then the symptoms seem to come back. There's an antibiotic that is used that works just in the gut but it's hard to say whether it's affecting the bacteria in the small intestine or, since it's non-absorbed, it goes right through the gut and can affect the bacteria in the large intestine. So maybe a bacterial overgrowth in the small intestine has absolutely nothing to do with the whole condition. Well, some people say it's the food that you eat. And that's a major concept. Is the food in our diet responsible for this kind of a problem? Well, we know that there's an increase in the amount of symptom, amount of the abdominal pain after a person eats, but we don't have precise food intolerances, not to specific foods that would affect lots of people. It seems that we don't really know too much about those kind of foods. Now, we know there are certain kinds of foods that seem to be relatively poorly tolerated. We'll talk about those in a little while. It seems also that it might be the kind of bacteria. You've heard about the good bacteria and the bad bacteria. Well, they might have some role in the story of irritable bowel syndrome. So we know that at least in animals, if they're under stress, they're going to produce certain kind of chemicals, the cortisone and everything else, and that's going to significantly impact on the kind of bacteria in the intestine. And we know that those lactobacilli that everyone says are good, and indeed they are probably pretty good, well, they're going to be reduced in amount in stressed animals. So we know that the fecal bacteria can be altered by stress, part of the brain-gut interaction that we mentioned a moment ago. Now, we also know that there are some poorly absorbable carbohydrates that can actually be fermented in the gut fermented in the gut and form short-chain fatty acids, and maybe that has something to do. And there's some good reason to believe that that actually is a significant part of the story, maybe a major part of the story. And maybe that all of this has to do with the change in the amount of serotonin, and then we get back to the same story. So if we look at the intestinal contents, then we say, well, Maybe we have a decrease in those lactobacilli and another kind of a good bacteria, we call it bifidobacteria. And maybe we have more of what we call the facultative anaerobes, and those are the staph and the E. coli. And as a matter of fact, when we do a study looking at the relative amounts of different kinds of bacteria, we find that there's something called firmicutis, and that is increased comparatively to what the bacteroides is. So we know that there's some kind of an imbalance, but it's a lot more complicated than just a little imbalance. So we also know that if we look at people who have the irritable bowel syndrome, there's a difference between those people and the people who are otherwise normal, but so too is there a difference between the people who have irritable bowel syndrome with constipation versus with diarrhea when we're talking about the intestinal bacterial content. And then we have another problem. And the problem is that the bacteria in the lumen of the colon, so the bacteria that are just floating around, sort of the transient kind of guys, 
they seem to be considerably different than the bacteria that are associated with the wall of the intestine. So we have the mucosal bacteria that are different from the luminal bacteria. Well, all of that's obviously very important. Then we have a problem with dysmotility. Dysmotility. That means the propulsive waves seem to be different in the people who have the irritable bowel syndrome versus normal and the irritable bowel syndrome with constipation versus the irritable bowel syndrome with diarrhea. Now, do we have a direct correlation? No, we really don't. But we know that there seems to be some sort of an abnormality. So if we look at the high wave propulsive contractions, as you would expect in diarrhea, well, we have more of them. In the constipation, we have fewer of them. Well, how about if we just look at the sense of incomplete evacuation? Person goes to the bathroom and says, hey, I didn't get rid of all of the intestinal contents. You would say that's rare in diarrhea. Well, actually, 50% of the people with diarrhea, irritable bowel syndrome with diarrhea, think that they haven't had complete evacuation as opposed to probably around 70% of the people who have constipation type. And then we have some abnormality on the muscles. And it seems the walls and the pelvic floor muscle the kind of muscles that seem to be affected in women, for instance, who have had children, women who have some incontinence of urine, the pelvic floor muscles seem to be a little weaker. Well, so too in people who have the irritable bowel syndrome, maybe we actually have some increased straining, some increased anal pain in some of these individuals. Maybe they have hyperfunctional muscles. Well, in addition to all of that, we have abnormal contractions that we can measure and exaggerated responses in these people who have the irritable bowel syndrome. And the question is, does any of that really matter? And at least at the present time, we don't know the answer. A lot of questions regarding what causes the irritable bowel syndrome, we don't know. And then there's another one. It has to do with serotonin. Serotonin is a chemical. Everyone knows about serotonin. That's why you take Prozac or Zoloft or... Paxil, you take it because it alters the serotonin level and treats the depression or treats the anxiety in some cases. Well, we also know that serotonin is produced in the gut and it seems to have a lot to do with one, crosstalk between the brain and the gut, the gut and the brain, and then seems to have something to do with the propulsive waves and the contraction of the gut. Well, that obviously is very important, and we know that there are certain chemicals that help get the serotonin level back down. So we know that it can be released from the cell. Well, it can't float there forever, at least in the case of diarrhea. It's thought that if you have too much serotonin, then you're going to have a problem with diarrhea might cause the increased propulsion. So we have to get rid of the serotonin. And one of the mechanisms is there's a chemical and it's called serotonin reuptake transporter that takes the serotonin, puts it back inside the cell. That obviously is important. Well, maybe we have some kind of a defect in this whole serotonin pathway. And indeed, it seems that people who have the diarrhea type of irritable bowel syndrome have a decrease in the reuptake of the serotonin as opposed to the people who have the constipation predominant irritable bowel syndrome, they seem to have impaired release. They don't have enough serotonin. And there are a bunch of different receptors, a bunch of different chemicals on cell surfaces, on those gut cells, and on those nerve cells, and on those muscle cells. And those receptors for the serotonin are different in different areas. And as a matter of fact, that seems to have some sort of a correlation with at least the symptom. And then we have hypersensitivity, and that's another issue. We have hypersensitivity to the gut. We don't know exactly where the hypersensitivity comes from. Part of it can come from that serotonin, but we have other chemicals. We have acetylcholine. Acetylcholine, that's from the vagus nerve, that sort of thing. Um, well, as a matter of fact, the uh, people who have irritable bowel syndrome seem to have what we call visceral hypersensitivity. So inelegantly, if we dilate the rectum, these people are going to have pain, pain experienced in the brain in certain areas that seem to be highly characteristic. 
And as a matter of fact, it isn't just rectal distension, it's distending the small intestine, descending, uh, distending the, the stomach or distending the esophagus, all of that is going to be associated with some kind of distress, some kind of distress felt in an area of the brain that seems to be stereotypical for these kind of patients. And as a matter of fact, we know that the gas can cause distension and that distension can also go on and apparently cause the symptoms. So we have visceral hypersensitivity in a significant number of people. In addition to this, we have some abnormalities of the barrier function. Well, maybe we have some inflammation in the gut, maybe minor inflammation, maybe we have an abnormality of some of the mast cells or some of the, the white blood cells that are in the gut, and maybe all of this can somehow interact and cause symptoms. Well, that's kind of the concept on why people get the irritable bowel syndrome, however and for whatever reason they get it. It's a very common problem, and it's a problem that we have to deal with. How do we deal with it? You stick with us, and we'll be back and tell you. <laughs>